so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ghislaine now. Um, Ghislaine will talk for around, around 40 minutes and then we'll have a further 20 minutes uh, for discussion. So like I said, please do put your questions in the Q&A as and when they occur to you. Don't, we don't worry about waiting till the end of the talk. Um, and, and I'll do my best to kind of pull questions in, in uh, uh, during the, the, the Q&A part of the, the, this hour. Um, so without, without, without further ado, just a few words about Ghislaine. Um, you know, she's got a, a fantastic history in performing arts and body technologies. And since the, the 1990s has been recognized as a pioneer in the exploration of digital intimacy, telepresence, and virtual physical blending, all things that have become increasingly present in our lives during the pandemic. As a curator, a keynote speaker, and radio presenter, she shared her outlook on the future human in, into the cultural, academic, creative industries, and corporate sectors worldwide. Uh, she's a presenter with BBC World Service flagship radio show podcast, Digital Planet, which I can uh, recommend that you, you subscribe to, you subscribe to and listen to now. And today she's talking to us, sadly not here with us in Bath, but um, from her home in London. So Ghislaine, over to you. Hello, Kate. Hello, and thank you very much for having me to do this lecture. Um, I know I would have loved to have been with you. Um, and in fact, I think we were even meant to originally to do this last year. So anyway, you're right. It's not completely um, out of out of the ordinary for me to be working into a virtual space. So I'm now going to share with you a slideshow and hopefully you'll be able to see me next to it. But while I'm doing that, can I, a few people have started doing it already, but wonderful if people put in where they are, where you, where you are at this moment, because I'm going to be talking about crossing time and space. And so I always love, I love it to see where, where people are actually listening in from. And this incredible access that we have from all over the world. I'm in Shoreditch in London. So, right, let me get my desktop up and let me get this working. Great. Remember, oh, perfect. Yeah. I'm going to double check the next one will show, Ghislaine. There. Yeah. Okay, all working well? Great. So, okay, so... I'm going to talk to you about connected bodies and about virtual physical blending in hybrid worlds. Um, thank you, Kate, for a good introduction. Um, as most of you know, I'm creative director for Body Data Space Collective, and I'm going to show some of our work and previous collectives, Chink Hansen's work. And I'm a reader in digital immersion at the University of Greenwich in London. So, um, and I do really enjoy doing the Planet Digital Planet show. So do subscribe to the podcast. So, so connected bodies, virtual physical blending in hybrid worlds. So body data space, the collective that I'm creative director for is an interdisciplinary creative um, uh, design collective based in East London. And it, we work with live presence and telepresence and virtual presence. We enable group immersion experiences and most of our work is about connecting across time and space. And our key line really is, and has for many years been, that the body is the interface. So we look to collaborate, to connect and to enhance. And just to clarify, Body Data Space emerged out of an earlier collective called Shinkansen, which started in 1989. Um, and about eight of us moved forward through future physical into body data space. So there's about 30 of us in this very fluid, open collective from many different backgrounds. So today I'm going to share with you some topical and, and pioneer references on the relationship between our physical cells and what I call our emerging data cells, this, this relationship between the two. And it's really based on my thoughts of our lived experience to date and looking towards what I consider to be our future multi-cells, which we're kind of, it's not even future anymore. We are in a multi-self place. And I'm going to look and bring up some of the positives and the negative issues in this ongoing convergence of our bodies and our technologies. And this is really seriously indicated today by the rapid advancement of virtual physical hybrid environments. And these we're seeing rapidly come through from for this for the future world of learning, teaching, socialising and the future world of work. So pretty much everything I say will relate to the teaching, 
side, the learning side of the world of work, because we're talking about that future environment and the future body. So as Kate said, I coming from a, a, a very practice led background in body and technology. I studied performing arts in the early 80s at Middlesex University, and my main focus was on dance and voice, both art forms which use the body in the main without any other tools attached. And I've always been interested in what we can just do with our living bodies, what we can do to enhance our lived experience. And Body Data Space has been working with this area of live presence and telepresence um, and the connections across time and space really intensively and particularly this merge between the physical and the data self. I'm going to talk mainly today about the telepresence side. And I'm going to talk about dancing and singing and how we actually use these examples onwards into today's world to enhance ourselves. So this slide is really just a fun slide to put up to emphasise my point that actually in most people in life dance and sing, even if it's only at weddings or to sing the national anthem once a year. But in a majority, dance forms of all types thrive across all cultures, from traditional and folk dance to ballroom and line dancing, clubs and rave dancing. And here we've got some pictures from Dionysus, from big raves and from the dance marathons of the 1920s. And it's an important and essential part of people's lives. And many of us know the joy of dancing in groups and singing in groups and choirs. And what I'm interested in is collective embodiment, the collective embodiment that enhances us and takes us up into a kind of more transcend transcendent joyfulness and vibration and how we actually deal with that in this more technological world. So I've believed very strongly in the rapid evolution of digital technologies into the mainstream that actually what happened in the 90s was it forgot the body in many ways. Technologists and many artists saw the body as obsolete. It really was a massive network of exchange of knowledge, really exciting and very vibration, vibrating, but an exchange of knowledge, the knowledge of the brain that filled the 90s with excitement. And yet our body knowledge got forgotten. And by the end of the 90s, the transhumanist viewpoint, what I call the download of my brain for posterity movement, with a bit of a smile on my face there, because I've got great transhumanist colleagues out there, um, became the dominant metaphor. Our brains attached to technologies like this image and with the body obsolete and invisible. Our body and its communication modes through gesture and motion is full of knowledge exchange opportunities and knowledge gains. The body is imperative in our intelligence and I always see intelligence between the body and mind or the body and the brain as a figure of eight, both equally needed and utterly synchronised and yet very rarely regarded as such and unfortunately especially in academic thinking, it's brain led. So the base of my work across these last 30 years has been grounded in a core understanding that to me has always seemed obvious, to be honest, that the living body, the living, breathing, sweating, gesturing body, as shown on this slide, the kind of essential liveness of us all, yeah, that the technologies that we create, that as living beings we create, should support and enhance life and expand us beyond and above our physical lived experience and enable us to move forward and extend our living essence. And so this led us as a group to actually design what we call the hypersensory body. And this is, you know, you in the middle, anybody in the middle, and all the little dots of a data that goes back and forward between us. And today, the majority of these data transfers happen in and out of our bodies. Obviously, audio and visual, we're doing it now. But many of the others, as we know, gesture interaction, motion capture, facial recognition, etc., cetera, are, are well used in today's technologies. And equally, on the other side, there's many artists and creative tech people expanding in the areas of smell and taste. We know touch has been out there for a while, biofeedback, and even into the areas of thought and brain connection. Now, the one thing about this hypersensory body, of course, is that you can turn it on and off. That so, you know, you can actually go, I'm turning all the tech off and I'm going to sit down in a room and have no tech around me. Um, but we also do have a memory store there, which is really useful. 
So we've concentrated on this and we've and I've been basically experimenting from the 90s onwards with technologies that actually enable this data transfer both to and from the body, whether it's been through triggers, sensors, reactors, generators, motion capture environments, telepresence in particular. And telepresence has been my main focus. It's been a key focus which was born out of a need in the early 90s to work with my dance colleagues across the world beyond our short bursts of time together in physical workshops. And this last year for me and for the other collective members in Body Data Space has been quite a bizarre scenario. And it's like some kind of horrendous universal research group occurred as we watched the same issues that we were encountering by the mid 90s, in particular, the fear of facing oneself within mediated environments with others. And I'm gonna come back more to that. In the late 90s, I worked with video artists and innovative, project, and innovated with projectors to create a baseline method of remote stage connectivity between two dance studios, next door to each other, actually. We used BNC cabling originally, enabling us to see, hear, and dance with each other in different spaces. And this exchange and had many advantages. We really enjoyed it. We did a lot of experimenting. And by the late 90s, after numerous connected workshops and stage works and club nights and all over the world, alongside all the issues that there were in the 90s of lag or latency, as we call it now, and other issues, we were able to articulate our belief in the positive side of audiovisual connected spatial environments, crossing time zones as if by magic and being able to dance with each other at a distance. So these is just a few early slides. Um, they're not the earliest actually, because we don't have enough images from then, but these are some of the telematic and telepresence, telematics it was called in the 90s, telepresence workshops and conferences that we were doing. The Butterfly Effect Network, which ran between 92 to 96 at Dartington International Summer School, the Virtual Physical Bodies Symposium that I ran at Middlesex University in 1999, and the big workshop, Cell Bites and Corpus Online, that were happening. This actually this set is from Lisbon, from Arizona, um, from Club Nights. And here's some more club nights, actually, club research and cluster club nights using telepresence between London and Colchester, between venues in London, the End, the Shamans Club and the ICA when it was doing club nights, etc. in London itself. And we also did live link ups to Kyoto, to Helsinki from the ICA, 98, 99, very wobbly, but we were at it then as well. So now we were not by any means the only people or the first people working with telepresence and i'm just going to show you two or three examples of people that really influenced me but once i found them which was a real relief actually they really helped me and this one of them is helen sky who's a choreographer um in a company called company in space based in melbourne in australia in the 90s um, they no longer exist as a company but she's still doing great work and she probably was the person that actually spent the most time in being a living virtual being in the 90s. She was really, really like the person that had really been there. And she wrote amazingly around this work, very poetically, around her making light of gravity work. And here there's a quote, where do flesh, fragile bone, senses and perceptions fit into the new geographies of the late 20th century? And a second person that's been very important that most of you will know is um, Roy Ascot. And Roy Ascot, Professor Roy Ascot, with his very important, this is an incredibly important book, Telematic Embrace. Um, this was actually, I think, put together from about uh, essays from the 60s right the way through. And his Telematic Embrace essay of 84, I think that was. And his first telematic project was in 83 but he was writing about network consciousness from the 60s and distributed authorship involving artists all around the world, basically building a theoretical um, framework around interactive artworks. And that has influenced most of us today, even unknowingly, yeah. And Roy is still around doing his amazing stuff, spreading his telematics and actually talking still about, and we all need to talk still about, what is the content? What is the content within these new technological um, ab abilities that we have? 
And actually, the third one I want to mention is an incredible public experiment that took place in 1980 with two artists, Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabin Rabinovich, um, in, in between New York and L.A., and they actually basically just put up in the middle of the night these screens, one in New York and one in L.A., and they just opened them up between the two. Like, And it was called Hole in Space. And at the next day and the next night, people just thought, what's this? And there was no information about it at all. But they realised they could see each other. And actually, that was incredible. And, and incredible emotions coming. People clapped and screamed with joy and shouted, hello, New York, hello, L.A., and shouting and singing to each other and dancing, yeah? And that's a great YouTube video to watch. It really is. There's some, some stuff there, some old archive material. So <clears throat> this is now the key aim of my research inquiries. Oh, sorry, back a slide. Oh, no, it's not going to go back on me. Um, OK, so I'll just read out. Really looking at how we can exist as both virtual and physical bodies simultaneously and how we can build trust and presence in this blended virtual physical state and how we will balance our own blended representation of self with that of others and how that's maintained now. Now we've gone through this period of lockdown. And as I was mentioning, telepresence, um, this is one of our earlier slides of skin touch feel, where we were looking at our skin becoming the interaction canvas as we connected two or three distant stages for dance performances, exchanging body knowledge, sharing our creative ideas and exploring solutions. Ah, oh, I think I might have a problem with the slideshow. Um, so, Kate, I'm going to stop a minute and just escape and share again. Okay, thanks, Ghislaine. We'll we'll just um we'll just wait mm -hmm. here with you while. Yeah, you... sorry, it's not moving either way, and in fact, it doesn't even look like I can escape. Um, oh dear, this has not happened to me before. No, this is a new one on me yeah. as well. Ah, well, that's gone to the next one, so maybe I can carry on. So, um. Looking at digital touch and creating teleintuition and ma mainly actually exploring digital intimacy. Exploring this methodologies of using cameras very close up and looking at macro and micro, the big body and the small body, the big parts of the body next to each other. And actually what we could play with in that. Really trying to play with the skin and the visceral within the web and the body interface being key, layering skin upon skin touch upon touch and trying to make the web at this point very knowledge based and we're looking here from 99 onwards I think this slide's probably about 2005 um, very very cool in knowledge based and without the body involved much at all and now I've got a little video I want to show you I hope this works there's no sound to this video this is from a workshop I did in 2000 which was linked to um uh, Middlesex University, where I was a research fellow with ResSen, and Arizona State University, where I went to run this workshop um, uh, between two studios on their big campus. And this for me was actually the very big aim. It took a long time to actually get this to happen, to get a digital intimacy, to get a touch and a feel between bodies in different spaces. Um, I think we probably did about 16 takes on this to actually get the arms of the distant dancer to wrap around the, the, the Buddha da style dancer sitting in the middle of this, this more forward space you can see. That's a really, really bad resolution little video. They were called cell bites. We were putting them on the web in 2000. So we made these tiny little pieces, which were more like little boxes you could open and look into. But you can see here the touch and the feel that we were aiming at. So even by then, we were well aware telepresence was just this great tool for intercultural understanding, for knowledge exchange, for skills bartering, for building trust and for community and public use, too. We started to look at public realm interventions and for creating debates and understanding pre-event and post-event knowledge transfer. You know, we were always doing live events, but we'd start pre-event and post-event using telepresence if we could. And re-examining identity, and this became really key for me. How do we look at identity and live and virtual presence with this expansion of the senses? And how do we develop an intuition, a tele-intuition within this kind of environment? So this re-examination, I've got that twice that point. So look at the positive shift, 
towards active rather than passive interaction. And this comes back to my brain attached to computer point. And I'm sure you all remember in the early 2000s, this issue about gaming and, and, the, and obesity coming up a lot in the pay, mainstream papers where we were well aware that gaming could become physical. Video gaming and virtual gaming could become physical, allowing a free flow of movement, not restricted. And also looking at this as um, a positive, a positive user experience, um, looking at uh, ethics all the time around it. But even then, in 99, we were well aware it was a distance bridger and that actually the cleaner eco footprint was, was part of the reason for starting to get this work to happen more often. Now, I'm going to go on to the next section, which is around the structured improvisation of virtual physical blending. And I'm going to very put that word into your mind, structured improvisation, because we've always been working as a collective in network collaboration. And we've used structured improvisation from the contact improvisation sector, which I came through through Chisholm Hill Dance Space. And it has become a really key part and I think a very important process for this particular point in time and onwards, because we need to have a fluidity within these created spaces. We need to have an interoffership, we need to be interdisciplinary, and we need to be open to an emergent dynamic. We need these participation in an, and, and enabling and interacting between each other to allow this type of scenario to happen in the best way possible. And this, we believe, can happen in what we call a collaborative share space. And here, this is where we meet others, whether this is a real time live space or whether it is actually a virtual space like today. And there we can exchange knowledge, skills, ideas and beliefs. But there is no question active participation is key. There's no flaneuring within these spaces. And this particular collaborative um, share space that I'm going to show you a couple of examples of next. This is a diagram that shows that the, the amount of tech that actually can hang in the middle of this collaborative share space, and which is today. And many artists and creative tech people are already working with three or four of these areas in convergence. And across the next 10 years, we'll see the convergence of these body led techs or body representative techs, yeah, start to converge more and more. And we've seen some experiments with that like this year too. And this is where we tether our physical selves to our data selves. We're alive, we're connected, and we're collective within this space. Now, this is a piece called Me and My Shadow. And I did this with Joseph Hyde, who is a professor at Bath Spa and a member of Body Data Space. We've been working together, I think, for about 20 years now. We did this with Body Data Space as a EU commission, National Theatre Commission for the Olympics year 2012. And Me and My Shadow used a virtual world, a big virtual world, human gestures, motion capture and full body telepresence, as well as a spatial sound setup. And I'm going to show a little bit of a video from this. So here you were in the box with no wires attached at all. It was a really key thing. We wanted to allow freedom of movement within there. And in that environment, there was four cities, Istanbul, London, Brussels and um, Paris, interlinked at the same time. And you met other avatars within that environment. And here you can see one of the, uh, the participants actually moving through very simple movements, gesture based forward and back and shoulder movements through that space, seeing herself as a real time avatar immediately and moving towards this moon in the center to try and meet each other. It was a really interesting project. And this is um, Bill Thompson, who's my colleague now actually on BBC Digital Planet, um, looking at pointing towards the interesting future where boundaries between the real and the virtual disappear. Sometimes you're in virtual space, sometimes you're in the real world and you cannot tell a difference. And this is what I'm interested in, in terms of blending, the blending of ourselves and virtual real worlds. And here you can see how people had incredibly time. We had about 9,000 people went through across the 10 days of the um, project. We had a really quite intense um, sign up for it. 
Um, and as you move towards avatars, of course, you went straight through them. You had these very beautiful encounters. We did get people to say, we said, try and hug in the middle. But we knew that wasn't the point. And you left behind traces of your own routes through the space, which for choreographers listening will be actually quite a beautiful thing because we have to learn those in our heads. It's part of spatial um, choreographic learning. As a dancer, you need to learn your floor patterns. Here we could see our floor patterns. <clears throat> Some really lovely comments afterwards from very wide range of people. Some people who'd never been touched even tech before, let alone into this kind of environment. And what we learned from that, we took into a new piece called Collective Reality in 2016, which we did as part of Future Fest. And this was a very large space, which was about experiencing togetherness. And it, it really was about digital intimacy. How could we actually, by moving together, by touching each other, create and generate the most beautiful environment that we could be in together? And so as you moved within this space, you experienced togetherness by actually moving together, touching, dancing, and that created the audio and visuals around. Um, they extended them, it hyper-enhanced them. The more togetherness that happened was done with a blob tracking system. And Joseph Hyde also worked on this. He did the sound side of this project. This project moved through several iterations and actually um, ended up working into the dome venue in Montreal. A really amazing experience. It's part of the IX Immersion Experience Symposium in 2017. And there we took, um, Joe and Nick Rothwell and I took um, a whole load of um, <clears throat> VR software um, uh, guys and girls, mainly guys actually, through um, collective embodiment workshops, looking at spatial understanding within this kind of generative immersive, immersive space. And it was the most amazing set of workshops actually. We had a real pile up of people coming and even the two years afterwards I was getting really good comments back from these software engineers who'd actually learned a lot from actually playing themselves spatially within this environment. <clears throat> so what next? What next for these kind of collaborative share spaces? And as I've mentioned, it is the convergence of technologies, but more importantly, the natural human needs that we have for collaboration through virtual physical co-creation, for mobility and immersion across time and space, and the evolution of a virtual physical presence that we need to have. And, and how do we develop remote trust, intimacy, and even sensuality through these forms? And the fact is that this is not an additionality. It's pioneer territory for everybody. And we need to recognise massive shifts in creation and processing and user testing and data analysis for these types of interactions. <clears throat> really big shifts. And we cannot just put classical or contemporary artworks into a digital interactive ecosystem and expect it to work. This will fail and we see failures happening. We've seen them this year, we've seen them before. And one cannot also, one can't apply a fixed system or a set protocol or one methodology to all types of exchange either. There's a lot of multi-learning to do here. And looking towards the future, this gets really complex. So I've just got a few examples here, quick examples of the, the future future. Implants that actually go into the body. This is the tiny implant that uh, Professor Kevin Warwick has been working with for many years and him and his partner here are actually connected bodies. They actually have their arms are connected through their implants. I actually have a small implant here, a medical implant called Impli, which I can open with my iPhone and it reads my medical information. Here I've been doing some implant parties on stage, actually parties, implant um, educational um, shows. Um, this is at Future Fest, this one, this is... Um, um, so Jeff Mulgan actually getting an implant done at Future Fest. I've also done them in large places like Mobile World Congress, etc. And they are being used extensively now for um, medical use, etc. This is the Mobile World Congress one. Medical use. And there's a lot of debate about implants being a possibility of actually us holding our own data within our own bodies and actually controlling it. Um, and there are, there, there, there are many cyborgs out there and working with the cyborg community. But in fact, the implant area is developing fast. Cybernetic contact lenses have still got a way to go, but they are coming. Um, there was some new stuff out on them today, even um, linked to batteries, tiny batteries that would be able to be held within contact lenses. Um, and this would be the augmented image over the world, actually seeing 
the real world and the augmented in front. And um, augmented reality we're working with at the moment, I'm very interested in that because it actually layers us into this blended area of virtual physical. And of course, holograms. This is a Voxon Photonics hologram, which we did with Digital Planet um, a couple of years ago, our last kind of live radio theatre show, actually. Um, an international holographic video call between Adelaide and London, when the first, world's first, apparently. Um, and we also cannot not mention robotics because robotics of this type, this, this high, high level robotics is representational of the self and can be us in another place as long as we have the control of it. So with these shifts in the concept of identity come big shifts in responsibility. How do data ethics and the public debate on personal data ownership feed into or off our identity and our communication methods for the future? In teaching environments, learning, research environments, as well as in the world of work. And this is the area I'm working with a lot at the moment, doing a lot of talking about, a lot of webinars on me, myself and my data. We know what's happening on facial recognition. It's been harvested from us all over the place. And we know that the Chinese system also uses this, their civil social credit system. But there is the word out there is very much that at least the Chinese government is honest about it. And it's transparent, whether you like it or not. The fact is that in Britain and other parts of the Western world, this is happening. We're just as much take having our faces taken and these kind of slightly bizarre and not very well scientifically thought out emotional um, uh, guess it, guesswork happening about us by corporates, by governments and by police forces. And biometrics as personal data, this public debate and regulation is really urgently needed. And it's come to the forefront this year because of contact tracing apps and because of vaccine passports. These personal biometric assets, our DNA, our fingerprints, our voices, our faces, our gestures, our gait is one of the really important ones. Posture, gaze, heartbeat, breath. All this data, when it's converged and processed with AI, gives away mass personal information about our behaviours, our moods, our emotions, much valued by advertisers to push us the products and services we believe we, that they, they believe we will buy next. And who owns that data? Who has the rights to those use? Who controls the ethical usage? We can hear this debate happening all around us now. As artificial intelligence merges with human intelligence, how do we ensure a moral and social framework around it is sound? And how do we ensure the access of a diverse range of people to counteract data bias? Because what is mainly happening is the average, the norm. And therefore, what we're, see we're seeing is a much more the extension of a, the outsider, which actually creates a bigger digital divide. And should we all have our own personal data dashboard? We are all unwillingly or willingly participants of data harvesting. And this issue does affect us all in our families onwards. Our children and our grandchildren will grow up into what decisions we take in the next few years. And Body Data Space has for a long time been advocating a personal data rights dashboard where we would control the settings ourselves with our own personal AI attached. Yes, we can share for social good into large data sets to aid global improvements, medical such as these COVID vaccines at the moment, climate, educational, etc. Yes, however, below the line, maybe for business use, we could tick boxes that say, yes, you can use my Sainsbury's data if you want, but I want financial return. For work use, of course, you can tick into collaborative groups that you choose to work with and for social use with families, etc. But you would have the opt in and opt out system attached to you, giving you your own body data space. So I want to mention the algorithmic sexism, racism once more, because this is written into the base of programming. Part of the problem with our with facial recognition is that it's using a system from many years ago, which actually Eckhart, Ekman um, based his initial emotional um, science on a series of expressions which actually were more like mime expressions that we know, like a big smile and an utter disgust and anger. So we are getting this average and we're getting a, a, a non-ability for algorithms to stop them even because it's so in the base of the programming that's happening. So how do we enable communities to extend their knowledge without interference from misinformation and misuse of our data? And how do we ensure 
diversity and inclusivity for all of us within there. Quickly, because I know I'm running out of time here, these are four points that I think are very key to development teams, companies, businesses, projects of all sizes. Always have a body expert at the core of a development team if you're working with a body interfacing technology from conception stage onwards, not just at the user research end. Whether it's a neurologist, a biologist, a dancer, whatever, depending on the emphasis of your product or service. And do make sure you get a transparent data ethics governance declaration around the use and protection of personal and private data. Be transparent about this up front on your website, up front um, in your project mission, not just this ridiculous multiple pages of terms and conditions that we all face today. And do actively involve yourself in what's called data union solutions. There's a lot of discussion at the moment, and I just did a webinar on it, um, the University of Greenwich, which is up on the University of Greenwich research space, looking at data unions, at federated learning, at decentralised systems, but looking to try and find positive solutions for us all about the ownership of data. My view for the future is even more fluid. My data body, body would be tethered to my physical body and in alliance with my own AI, and it would bridge and enable cooperation and conversation, creating a bond between my multi-self, myself, my physical self, my virtual self. My data body would be transportable across time and space, and it will augment me and it will represent me outwardly, anywhere and everywhere, through my avatars, my robots, my holograms. It will network me and support me within an ever-growing complex weave of digital identities and processes. And it will enable me to find the best outcomes for my personal needs. And I will own that data body. And I would like to own that data body and my own AI to enable this to happen in my life. So... I can sit there alone as a physical person in my generative image and audio spaces, or I can choose to be with others and actually work as an internet of bodies. And here, this is part of collective reality. This is what we've all been missing this year, this deeper hug connectivity. But how do we develop that now and how do we find the positive ways forward on it? It is a really complex system and no one understands it yet. And I can actually assure you, big business doesn't understand it any more than we do. Everybody is a radical innovator and it's new learning for all. These are hugely complex patterns of interaction between makers and users. And it's layers and layers of interwoven non-linear journeys, which our digital selves move through alongside our physical selves, mega data flows extending all around us and from us. So let's prioritize the personalised digital intimacy and trust development. And let's try to enable collective embodiment to work holistically within our intelligence by creating this more virtual physical blended experiences for positive human sensory enhancement. And I believe this is our inherent responsibility as living emotional beings. And I call this the Internet of Bodies. So thank you. I will stop the slideshow there and invite Kate to join me. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> I think I've got a, got a couple of minutes over and I do have a few more slides, but we can come back to those if you'd like to. Yeah, you know that. So yeah, Thank you, Ghislaine. That was really wonderful, really so thought provoking. And I can see a few questions are now coming up into the Q&A. But I just wanted to uh, to kick off the discussion, really. I, you know, I think you've really you've you know, you've summarized the kind of um, the dilemma that we all face, really, which is that um, the whole, the whole, you know, the, the growth of the use of personal data is both terrifying and also marvelous at, at, at the same time. And I think, I think many people as individuals really struggle to see how they can gain control over their own data and how, you know, we as, as individuals can, um, can, I mean, I think the public, our, our, all of our uh, perception of this conversation is becoming increasingly sophisticated. But at the same time, I think a lot of people find it increasingly worrying. So I think that, I mean, you, you, did, you have touched on that, but I think it'd be really interesting just to hear a bit more from you on that when it comes to individuals in particular. Yes, I do. I think before this year, um, the, this last year with lockdown and with a lot more mass discussion about our data, yeah, 
the 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 this personal data scenario some people were aware and would either be i really don't like this and other people were like well so what you know i'm not a criminal i'm not it's not a problem if my face is taken you know i'm not doing anything bad i you know so what if someone's tracing me round but i think this year's really put it on the spot and it's partly to do with the fact that actually um in research when you ask people about their data their personal data the one bit of data they are really not happy to have shared is your medical data yeah most people feel very very um personal obviously about our doctors histories etc and um cambridge analytica of course brought to the forefront a knowledge in a much bigger way of how data was being misused to shift elections to shift ways of buying things etc but that was our emails our dates of birth our you know and so i think that while we've all been worrying about that and still thinking, wow, that's terrible that happened, you know, and how ghastly a Facebook or whatever, you know, etc. Behind the scenes, quite quietly, the culprits have gone, let them worry about that. We'll get on with the biometrics, actually, because that's much, much more useful to us. Yeah. So this year with the contact tracing apps, I think it started. Um, I think I've done many lectures with students this year, many who are just not at all happy about being traced, where they're going, you know, which pub next, or of course, you know, where they where they are at night or whatever, et cetera. Um, I think the vaccine um, passports thing has really brought it to the forefront because we've really recognised how that can be so divisive, yeah, to, to society. Um, and it, it's been in the press a lot more and in the mass press too. It's a bit like the word algorithm, actually. Algorithm suddenly has become much more understood because of the A-level algorithm getting discussed in the press. Yeah, yeah. So, um, that's when it came through. So today now we do have a much bigger debate about personal data. Um, and while actually what happens to continue around us is that our data has been harvested en masse. Yeah, no, and and that that I mean, the, for anybody who's not in the UK, the 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 A level, it, it's uh, the final secondary school, high school set of exams, which last year the government tried to decide the results on using an algorithm, which went very badly wrong. Uh, this was because of the pandemic. So, um, as as Glenn says, we all learned what an algorithm was at that at that stage if we didn't already know. Um, so yeah, that's that's. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a complex area, isn't it? But I mean, I personally, and I I think there's one of the questions there um, from uh, W I L C five. My instinct is to withdraw. For instance, I don't use social media. I realize it's impossible to hide completely. Is there a lobbying element to your work? And I think that's something that is really common to lots of people. And, myself included that sometimes I just think okay I'm just gonna hide I'm just gonna you know but of course that's that's actually not what I want to do so what's your thinking on on that yes I mean I think telepresence um you know we are in a mediated form here so yeah it is actually a performative form yeah and we know that you know we've all sat through hundreds of zooms this year painfully zoom and other platforms and seeing the painfulness and the fear of people having to one face yourself and see yourself all the time which is enough of a shock because at least if we're in a round table you're looking at other people's faces not at your own yeah <laughs> but also when you you know when you've got a, a group of people and half of them are like like this yeah back 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 or trying to hide or whatever it really doesn't help with getting a trust or a, 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 a dynamic meeting going or a, a dynamic de de debate to happen so so to a certain extent we have to join in if we're going to be within that world and it's not going to change because many people I know at the moment who've gone back to work are sitting around tables with half of their colleagues still in tele telepresence so that's the hybridity you know either they're they're sitting with eight of them around the table looking at their laptops where another eight people are coming in virtually or there's a big screen with everybody who's not there on so the hybridity is there to remain and you know if you have a choice to do some days working at her working from home wfh you know you may well then be choosing to actually put yourself back into this space of course whether you like it or not i think withdrawing is a difficult one because it, in a way, we are very privileged, privileged to even think we can withdraw or that we should withdraw because, you know, there's still a billion people in the world who have never, ever been on the Internet. Yeah. And even more who have very, very little access and very little data. And we know during lockdown 
There's families all over the world who have shared one smartphone between, you know, five, six, ten of them to actually do all their work, all their schoolwork, everything because of the lack of um, access to this scenario of data transfer of audio visual. Um, I have a lot of friends who would love to go off grid. I slightly chide them because it's like, well, you know, you've got the option to go off grid. This is incredibly elitist position to be in. Yeah. So I feel like if anything, even if you don't want to be right up front social media wise, you don't have to, you know, right there. We should be lobbying for fair digital access and for the data access to be personally held. Um, data access and data tra data harvesting actually earns companies. Um, if we had it ourselves, we would earn between fifty to hundred thousand a year from our data use. Yeah, it is massive. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So actually, if we even if we tick that money away from ourselves, but back into data access for other people in countries where there is very little money for data access, that would be positive in itself. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic way of looking at it. Um, I, and that leads also to uh, Lucy Will's question uh, that's in the Q&A about how virtual spaces have enabled many more people to take part in group events. And how can we create hybrid spaces that are just as accessible to disabled people or even mo more so? And that links to um, a piece of research that we've commissioned here at Bar Spa into, into hybrid hubs and into the... I mean, just this afternoon, we were doing what you talked about, the blend of physical. We had six people in the room and three people online, and, and we still are incredibly bad at that. Um, but yeah, just to return to return to that 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 idea around access and hybrid hubs a bit a bit more, Ghanaian. Yes, I think um, this year we've seen, and we are actually in the next year or so, and even the next few months, keep an eye out, going to see the release of some quite large scale, commercially created <coughs> environments for this mixed hybrid presence um, to take place in. A lot of them, of course, they're creating them for, for corporates and for big companies. So, you know, some of them are focused on upskilling. Some of them are focused on team meetings. Some are focused on conferencing. Some of the mix of the whole lot. Um, Lucy's point about um, mobility and um, uh, disabled access is one that um, is key to thinking about these tools. And many tools, actually, in technology have actually been evolved originally linked to special needs access. Yeah. And we're... For example, a lot of special needs access tools are now used for longevity for senior people as well as for special needs people. I think that um, what's special about um, the telepresence scenario is, of course, it allows a wheelchair user in non-physically. We still have to continue to allow access physically for that, that user. But what it also allows in um, the telepresence one is many people who were not necessarily stamped as non-mobile. So that might be people with three kids to care for or senior care to do or just without the money to actually travel to that conference or to fly. Yeah, we, we've been in a very, very close clique of people moving around. I've been incredibly lucky. I've worked all over the world. Yeah, but I realise that that has, you know, in some ways, not totally necessary to do that. It should, if, I did, if I did a 50-50 even, it would be better. Yeah. But we still got a lot to happen on this, yeah. And I'm still yeah. waiting for some more exciting stuff to come through. Well, and, hope, and hopefully it will. I think Naomi, Smith's com Naomi Smith's com uh, question here about is a really nice one. What, what have your most satisfying and vivid sensory experiences of embodied social connection through technology been and why? I mean, I think you showed some really beautiful examples of that in the first half of your lecture. But just to return to, to get away from the really scary stuff and go yeah. back to the, the beauty that's in, always been in your work, Ghislaine, that's always been something that I found really inspiring. And even those two very short pieces that you showed the videos of, the two short videos, um, really demonstrated how beautiful the work can be. So, uh, yeah, so what have your most satisfying and vivid sensory experiences been? Well, 
I have to say, um, I've often we've been told a bit utopic about all this and I just want it all to be lovely and beautiful and joyful. But actually I do. Yeah. And I think we can and have we in physical life. We have some amazing sensory experiences, all of us. Yeah. It's particularly in lovemaking, in our family love, in our hugs, etc. And so I've always thought, no, this really does need to be um uh, uh, extended by the, and enhanced by this hyper embodiment side. But one of the first experiences I had that completely blew my mind was doing VR. And I actually don't work in VR because I don't like the disembodiment of the headset. Um, and particularly when you see 20 people in a room with head things on, I don't get it. So, you know, why would you not physically be with each other, you know? But um, the VR experiences in the early 90s um, that I had, particularly um, Char, Char Davis, the Osmos piece that most people will know. I did that at the Barbican when it was there as part of um, Serious Games exhibition. And that blew my mind, really blew my mind. A most amazing piece of work, yeah. And I think more recently, um, I'm really finding the AR scene very interesting and fascinating. And we're just working at the moment on a um, Innovate UK project, which we're finishing fairly soon, the first um, MVP of a, a digital intimacy gifting app, which is in AR. And which uh, today we actually just, this morning I was watching the um, tests of it. I've been able to send, for example, Kate, I'd be able to send you a digital bunch of flowers after this um, uh, to thank you. And it would be, it would arrive for you at your home address and you view it for your mobile. And actually there would be your AR bunch of flowers would emerge in your room and would grow into, and you could have, maybe I'd send you 10 or 12. So you had a whole garden growing all around you, you know. So I'm interested in how we now do digital expressions of kindness, of goodness, of sensitivity, and how we get that out there. Yeah, no, I think digital expressions of kindness and, and also your very interesting work on digital in intimacy, which we've only, we've only yeah. just touched on today and, and how how important that that seems in the it, certainly in the in the in terms of the pandemic but but also uh, more more broadly um, there's a question there from 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 Tracy follows it's it's there's a couple of questions in in the one question but i thought i thought maybe you could focus on um, body data and climate activism and how those two things might 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 be blended in uh, and perhaps thinking again from a more from a kind of positive a positive point of view how what could we do in that field where body, bringing body data and climate activism or climate data together? Well, Tracy, thank you. That's a, that's a really positive um, question for what I'm working on at the moment, as you know. And I think that um, during this Innovate UK project, we've had some time to research into the issues of, for example, AR and the AR cloud, looking at the green cloud, looking at how much body data is being gathered by us, as we all know, these huge data farms, but actually they, they, the one, one estimation is that 30% of heat being pushed out from tech, not technology in the world at the moment is coming from these massive data, data farms where all our data is held, yeah? And that's why a lot of them are built on the edge of the Antarctic and Arctic, yeah, to try and cool them down. Um, so with the body data side, one of the things with Digital Planet that we cover a lot is the individual doing work with sensors around climate change. So let's just give one example would be farmers in, say, um, a, a part of Africa who have sensors in the earth, in the soil, in multiple villages all around them and actually feed back the temperature of the soil. And then they receive data from the weather places too, which help them to learn when to plant. No, leave it a couple more days because actually it was going to not be enough rain for another week and we need your seeds to get rain straight away. And this is kind of local grassroots, you know, initiative, which is passed through data being passed through multiple individuals. So it is decentralized yeah, into central places and back out with additional data like weather data attached to it to individuals to actually enable them to deal with climate issues and climate change. Um, and I think there'll be so many more coming up and I'm sure Tracy and I end up having a long talk about that soon. <laughs> great, great, really fantastic. Um, well, we're drawing, we're drawing near to, to the end of, to the end of today. Um, uh, so I think uh, there's, there's still some really interesting questions there. There's some really interesting comments in the chat, but, but we're going, we're going to run out of time as it, as is always, always the way. Uh, but I, I, 
I wanted to um, to just uh, say a few things before we end, Ghislaine. Um, so I just I wanted to mention our next event, uh, which is our conference on writing and technology, which is called Mix uh, 2021, which will take place the 5th and 6th of July. So um, have a look out for that. I'll I'll stick it uh, if someone could stick a stick a, a link in the chat. I would appreciate that. Um, I wanted to thank uh, my deputy in the Center for Cultural and Creative Industries, uh, Dr. N Natasha Kidd, who's been helping, helping us uh, with this um, online public lecture today, and, and also Louise Chapman, who uh, works with us in the center, who's, um, who always helps make everything run, run well. But, but most of all, of course, I wanted to thank you, Ghislaine. Uh, we've tried as, you know, this, I think it's, God knows how long we've been trying to get this lecture to happen. Um, and it's such a pleasure today to, to hear you talk. You know, you, you range across such a broad area for, you know, from, from dance all the way to, you know, this complicated and kind of head spinning, but truly important and really interesting research in, that, you, that you do through body uh, data space. So I just really want to thank you so much for taking the time to prepare for the prepare for this today and to, to, to give us such an interesting insight into your work. Um, really just just really fantastic. Thank, thank you so much. And, and thank you also to all the attendees and to the really interesting questions. And, and I hope that it's um, I hope that it's been been interesting for you. If you want to know about more about us about the Center for Cultural and Creative Industries and the studio at Palace Yard News, um, you can find us online and you can Follow us on the social media where we give away our hundred thousand pounds worth of data every every, <laughs> every year. <laughs> so no, thank, well, thank you too. Thanks a lot. And um, one of the things we talked about, Kate, was gesturing up. Yeah, and people probably noticed. I there's one really sharp last piece of advice to everyone is when you're doing the Zoomy zoom stuff, yeah, get your gestures up. We gesture too low and we do miss that's the body knowledge and body language. So go for it and enjoy it. And thanks very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone.